Suddenly, the music changed. A maiden, fully adorned and veiled, rode into the palace on a horse with escorts. When the prince saw her, his heart melted, and he stood on his feet and watched the maiden come in. Everyone was stoked. Who was this maiden? Once upon a time, in the majestic kingdom of Obudu, nestled atop a hill in the eastern part of Nigeria, a tale of love, betrayal, and redemption unfolded. Obudu was a land of abundance adorned with silver and gold, and blessed with fertile soil that yielded bountiful harvests, particularly during the Riverdium festivals, where visitors from distant lands marveled at the kingdom's splendid tubers. At the helm of this flourishing kingdom stood King Ezedike, a paragon of virtue, bravery, and diligence. Revered by all, he governed with wisdom and compassion, ensuring peace and prosperity reigned supreme throughout his reign. Beside him stood his devoted wife, Ukamaka, a pillar of strength and support. They both had four children, three girls and one boy. Azubike, who was destined to carry forth the legacy of the noble lineage. Ezedike sent his only son, Azubike, abroad to get the best education, so he could, with his knowledge, bring great development to the kingdom when he returned. Meanwhile, on the outskirts of Obudu lived Uwa, a hard-working farmer. He was a yam and vegetable farmer known throughout the kingdom of Obudu. Uwa got married to Adima, a very beautiful girl from Obudu, but she died two days after having their first daughter. It was an unbearable loss to him as he loved his wife so much. After five years, he decided that Chinwe, his daughter, needed a mother and got married to Ugoli, a maiden from a neighboring kingdom. At first, Ugoli pretended to be a good woman. She treated Chinwe like her own daughter. But a few years after she had her own twin girls, she changed and began maltreating Chinwe. Whenever her father left the house, Chinwe became her maid, and at the slightest provocation, she would beat the hell out of her. After Chinwe lost her mother, Uwa covered up, never letting her feel the vacuum, but this woman reminded her daily that she was a motherless child and a child of misfortune. She told her that her entrance into this world ended her mother's life and she was going to make sure she killed her before she ruined her own life. Chinwe became a very sad child. One night, she asked her father how her mother died, just to be sure she didn't kill her. Uwa was shocked. His daughter had never asked him such a question before and he wondered where it came from. Just as he was about to respond, Ugoli came in with a fresh palm wine and invited him into the bedroom. He left Chiwe and followed her after promising to answer her question the next day. Uwa forgot Chiwe's question and the torture continued. At night, she would send Chiwe to the river to fetch water and threaten to kill her if she ever mentioned it to her father. Chiwe would sit at her mother's grave and cry all night. One day, Chiwe broke a pot on her way back to the stream. The pot was too heavy and she couldn't carry it. That night, her stepmom flogged her with a cane soaked in a dash of red hot pepper. It was an unforgettable experience for Chiwe. She cried all through that night. And when her father asked, her stepmother told him she stole all the meat in the pot. 
It was as if this woman charmed her father because he believed everything that came out of her mouth. A few years later, Uwa fell sick and died. Chiyingwe became very scared. At this point, she was 15 years and her twin stepsisters were 8 years. Her stepmom called her a witch and told the villagers she killed her father. Many believed her because she always pretended to be a good woman outside her home. But some still saw her for who she really was. Many young girls avoided Chiwe. No child wanted to have anything to do with her. At the stream, they would curse and taunt her. You witch, you killed your mother and now your father. Who will you kill next? Please tell us. They mocked her as they threw stones at her. Life was unbearable for Chiwe. Her stepsisters weren't even helping matters. They would commit a crime and accuse her falsely. And their mother, who hated Chiwe with passion and for no reason, would punish her severely. Chiwe was their slave. She did all the weeding on the farm, fetched water and firewood, went to the market, cooked and served everyone washed clothes and did all other house chores. Back at the palace, the king was getting old and sick, and the prince was not back yet. As tradition demands, the prince must be married before the king dies in order to succeed the king. This got everyone worried. If the king should die before his son's return, their family would lose the throne. As days passed by, the king's health continued deteriorating. Messages were sent to Azubike abroad to come back and take a wife as his father was dying. When Azubike heard this, he became scared. His father was hale and healthy when he left home, and now he was dying. He booked the next available flight and rushed back home to see his father. He sent a letter back home informing his family that he would love to return. But he would like it to be a secret for reasons best known to him. Although the villagers were anticipating his return, but he wouldn't want them to know he was back. His family agreed to his request. Two weeks later, Azubike returned home. It was a great day to celebrate. He looked so grown and handsome and his mother couldn't suppress her emotions. She hugged him tightly and wept. Azubike had left home when he was 15 and 17 years later, he was back. It was a long, long time for a mother not to see her son. His father, the king, was also happy to see him. His little boy has grown into a respectable, handsome young man. He held his father's hand. He was happy to meet him alive. At night, his mother, the queen, came into his room and woke him up. This time, she wore a sad look on her face as she sat on his bed and told him how important it was for him to get married as soon as possible. No one knew how long the king still had to live, and they had both worked hard to build the kingdom to the point where it presently was. I will send out a word to gather all the maidens in our kingdom in four days, so you can choose your wife. We can't afford to lose this kingdom. We walked too hard. The prince was quiet, and then he spoke. Mother, I hear your words, and will find a wife before the king dies. You may invite the maidens, but I want it to be in twelve days. I need time to also look around. The queen was silent. 
She was scared the king would die before then, but the prince assured her that the king wasn't going to die and the gods would keep him. Still, he pleaded not to let anyone know he was back. The next morning, the queen sent out a word to the town crier to announce that the prince would be coming back soon. And in 12 days, all the eligible maidens would be gathered in the palace as the prince would be choosing a wife. The news spread across the kingdom and all the young maidens were happy. They started making preparations and getting themselves ready to be chosen as wife and the new queen in the making. Indeed, it was a joyous day. Ugoli was not left out. She had two beautiful daughters and knew that the prince would not take his eyes off them when he saw them. She went to the market and bought costly soap and oil to nurture their skin before the D-Day. All the young girls in the village were doing the same thing. Ugoli went the extra mile to even see a strong herbalist who promised that he would help ensure that one of her daughters was going to be the next queen. She was confident as this herbalist, Uzoka, was highly spoken of. He started a ritual and purification process for her twin girls, Ne and Ada. Uzoka's maiden servants took special care of these girls, giving them special food, bathing them with specially prepared water, and massaging their skin with a very costly oil. In a few days, they were glowing. Their mother was so excited that she began announcing that one of her daughters was going to be the next queen, and she would become Ne Lolo. Amidst all this, no one remembered Chiwe. While everyone was preparing for this royal marriage, Chiwe was either on the farm fetching firewood in the forest, at the stream or slaving as usual at home. Ugoli couldn't stop boasting about her daughters and how she would die her slave. Chinwe worked to make all the money she used to prepare her daughters for the prince. She has embraced her unfortunate fate and patiently waited the day death would come to take her. The herbalist was demanding more money daily. And Ugoli seriously was under pressure. All the money Chinwe made from weeding people's farms were not enough. She went to a very rich chief in the village, Obieze. Obieze was an old man who had eight wives that he always abused. He was rich, yet his wife suffered. She promised him that she would pay back when her daughter became the queen. And if she failed to do so, she would give him young Chiwe as wife. Obieze loved young girls, so he quickly agreed. Ugoli had no plans to pay back. She would give Chiwe to old Obieze, who never treated his wives well, while her daughters enjoyed in the palace. She laughed at her thoughts. Such an unfortunate poor thing. The villagers have never been this busy in a long time. Even in festive periods, the market bustled and in the midst of the whole festivities, they failed to recognize the madman roaming the streets of the village begging for food. He posed as distraction to them and they chased him about anywhere he entered. No one cared about him. They were all getting ready to be in-laws to the royal family. Anywhere he entered, people chased him out. Some even beat him with sticks. One evening, he strolled into Uwa's compound and met Chinwe cooking. He pleaded with her to give him some food to eat. Chinwe felt pity for him. Her stepmother was out and she could quickly give him little food to eat as he looked really famished. 
She asked him to sit down. I will give you some food, but there is no meat, as my stepmother counted it. Even I am not allowed to eat meat. The madman stared as if he understood what she was saying. She gave him food, and he pounced on it and ate like a hungry lion. She couldn't believe one could be this hungry. He ate and licked the plate, wiping at it with his fingers as he smacked his lips. It was a delicious meal, and Chinwe watched him with satisfaction. A smile plastered on her face. He thanked her and left after he was done eating. For the first time in a long time, Chinwe felt appreciated. That night, she couldn't stop worrying about the madman. The next morning, after cooking, she stole out some food and wrapped it for him, hoping he would again come. In the evening, he came and Chinwe handed him the food. He was so happy and left with heat. This continued for days. One evening, he came as usual to collect food, and as he was leaving, Ugoli came in and saw him with the wrapped food. She was so mad that she pounced on Chinwe immediately. You evil and cursed child, you dare give my food to a madman. The madman ran for his life as she also threw stones at him. Ugoli screamed and called Chiwe all sorts of names. She told Chiwe that she would work on her farm day and night without food as punishment until she was satisfied. Unknown to them, the madman locked behind the wooden fence watching Ugoli and Chinwe. He felt so sorry for the poor girl. The next day, Chinwe began serving her punishments. She walked endlessly on the farm without food and under a scorching sun. At noon, a maiden brought her food. She said her mother instructed her to bring her some food. Chinwe didn't know this maiden. But she took the food. She was very hungry and didn't mind if she was going to die. After all, she prayed every night for death to come. She ate the food quickly and returned the plate to the maiden, who journeyed back home. Every day, this maiden brought her food, and as Chiwe ate, she never stopped thinking about the madman. Since the incident, she hasn't seen him and she longed to see him just to be sure he was eating and fine. Every night, she silently prayed for him. The long-awaited day was finally approaching. All the maidens were prepared except for Chinwe, who was always on the farm. Her stepsisters came back looking as charming as never before, their skin smooth and shining as bright as the sun. Just one look at them, and you will know for sure that they were specially made for the palace. They were to stay indoors till the next day, which was a D-Day. Chiwe was sad. She silently wished she could be amongst these maidens. If only her mother was alive. She cried endlessly as she walked on the farm that day. On her way home at night, she was kidnapped by some unknown men. They forced her into a car and took her away. A passerby ran to the house and informed her stepmother, but she was more concerned about her daughter's preparation to become the prince's bride. No one cared about Chinwe's disappearance. The next day, the palace was fully decorated and filled to the brim. Musicians and bands filled the arena. Various musical instruments were giving out melodious sounds in the air. Jubilation was everywhere and the king was still alive. Maidens were anxious as their hearts skipped a bit. They all wondered who the next queen will be. Mothers were not left out. They prayed for their daughters to be chosen. No one has seen the prince in a very long time and they wondered what he looked like. Time would reveal all.
A troupe of dancers entertained the audience. They were all dressed in their best attire and swayed their waists to the rhythm of the music. The crowd clapped and cheered them on. Masquerades jumped up and down, trilling the audience. Finally, the floor was open. The prince came out dressed in his royal regalia, looking so handsome and charming. Girls had butterflies in their tummies. They never expected him to be so handsome. This made many wish they would be chosen. He was dark, tall and so handsome. Plus, he was cold in the white man's land. He sat on a well-decorated royal chair close to his mother. Drums rolled and the maidens began dancing. They would dance before the prince and pass by until he found the right maiden. For hours, the maidens danced by, yet the prince merely seemed to be entertaining himself. The long line was finishing and the prince was yet to choose a wife. Beautiful maidens were passing and none of them were chosen, including Ugoli's twins. Earlier on, Ugoli had hired a horse that brought them into the palace. The smiles that graced her cheeks in the morning were fading away as she watched the events with mixed feelings. She had put in her all, including borrowing money from Obieze, and Chinwe was nowhere to be found. What was happening, she thought. The lines finished and no queen was chosen. Worry was written all over the face of the queen. Does the prince know what he was doing? She thought. Suddenly, the music changed. A maiden, fully adorned and veiled, rode into the palace on a horse with escorts. When the prince saw her, his heart melted, and he stood on his feet and watched the maiden come in. Everyone was stoked. Who was this maiden? The escorts helped her down the horse and led her to the prince. She stood before him and bowed her head as the prince stared at her. His jaw dropped. He had never seen such stunning beauty before. He turned her to face the crowd as he pronounced her the chosen queen of Obudu kingdom. Drums rolled and people rejoiced. Ogoli felt a stab in her chest as she watched the chosen queen. Recognition hit her. That was Chinwe, the unfortunate child as she named her. Tears rolled down her cheeks as the prince narrated how he turned into a madman to seek a good woman like his mother as wife. Beauty was not all I wanted, but I found beauty with a good heart, he concluded. Chimwe looked at the prince. She couldn't believe the prince was the madman the villagers, including her stepmother, chased away. She had spent days worrying about him. Ugoli was ashamed of herself. She regretted how she treated the prince. He would never forgive her after he saw what she did to Chimi. She bowed her head in shame and ran out of the palace as her children followed her. The date for the coronation was announced and everyone continued to enjoy the ceremony. Many maidens came to congratulate the new queen and the whole palace was filled with joy. The queen couldn't stop marveling at the wisdom of her son. He had found himself a good wife within a short period of time. Back home, Ugoli could not pay Obieze back, and he started requesting for his money. Finally, he took his twin daughters as wife. Ugoli was thrown into sorrow and mourning. Truly, we reap what we sow.